Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the union session called A Climate and Ecological Emergency, Can a Pandemic Help Save Us? Um, over the last year, we have all been working from home. We've been doing our science from, well, rooms like these. Um, and whilst working on our geosciences, we have witnessed how in times of crisis, drastic policy changes were implemented based on advice from the scientific community. But at the same time, we have witnessed governmental decisions that completely ignored scientific consensus, apparently giving higher priority to other concerns. Um, we've seen countries come together to face global crisis together. And we have seen countries trying to shut the outside world out and weather the storm alone, some more successful than others. The team of conveners of these sessions are all, like most of you attending each EGU, uh, geoscientists who do their job in time of human-induced global climate change. And watching the events of last year unfold, we asked ourselves, what can geoscientists learn from this unfolding pandemic on how to communicate scientific results to make sure policy is made based on solid science? And also, which examples should we definitely not follow? My name is Rolf Hurt. I'm an assistant professor at Delft University of Technology, and I'm honored to be part of the convener team that hosts this session. Uh, my fellow conveners are Professor Ian Stewart, Professor Haley Fowler, Mr. Nick Everard, and Professor Hannah Cloak. And together we managed to invite a selection of speakers on the interplay of global climate change, changing organizational culture, and impact on policy. First, we will give our speakers the opportunity to introduce themselves and their views on this topic. Then we will move on to a panel discussion where the audience is also invited to ask questions. Questions can be asked in the Q&A below and will be relayed to me by the amazing EGU staff making this all possible. But first, um, before we move to our first speaker, I briefly want to give the floor to EGU president. Uh, well, I have to say former EGU president, because I think he his term ended uh, yesterday. Isn't that right, Professor Alberto Montanari? Yes, that's right. Uh, thank you very much, Rolf, for introducing me. And I'm pleased to confirm that the EGU Council and the whole community is looking forward to this session with excitement. We know that uh, reacting to the pandemics uh, requires uh, an international effort that has to be supported by the scientific community. We feel it's a duty of geoscientists, and therefore we feel it's a mission of EGU to provide the scientific support for making a synergy of the efforts required to react to the pandemic and react to the climate emergency. This is why EGU is also liaising with sister associations and with policymakers to provide scientific advice to favor and support a more favorable and improved relationship between the humans and the environments at all levels. Again, I think the pandemics gives us a opportunity, an opportunity to put steps forward towards uh, mitigating and possibly and hopefully resolving the climate emergency. So once again, I really would like to say that we are looking forward to this session and I hope that we may also get some scientific output, some indication for ways forward for scientific research to support moving forward towards a better and improved climate and relationships between humans and nature. Thank you very much, Rolf. Thank you very much to the speakers. Uh, and uh, now I sit in the audience with real pleasure. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Roberto Montanari. Uh, also, thank you for your service to the EGU community over the, over the past years. Um, we're going to move to our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Catherine Heal. She's a professor of political science at Texas Tech University, where she is the director of the Climate Science Center. She is also CEO of the consulting firm Atmos Research and Consulting. Uh, in 2014, the American Geophysical Union, our sisters, brethren over at the other side of the Atlantic, awarded her its Climate Communication Award. Professor Heo is known for, in her science communication, 
being able to convince people who initially don't share the scientific consensus on human-made climate change to change their views, including her own husband. Professor Heyo, the digital floor is all yours. Thank you so much. When we talk about COVID and climate change, there are many things that they share. I'm going to begin with the negative ones and then progress to some of the positive ones. So sharing my screen here. The first thing they share is that we knew about the risks far in advance. People have known about the risks of zoonosis, the transfer of viruses from animal to human populations for a long time, and the risk those pose to human populations. And of course, we've known about climate change for a very long time. The science has been studied since the 1800s, and scientists were sufficiently concerned about the risks to formally warn a US president 55 years ago now. This is an old headline. So if these were events were foreseen, if they were no mystery, why were we so underprepared? There's a basic human phenomena that we all share called psychological distance. We often view risks as being distant in time or space, being abstract rather than concrete, and being irrelevant to our primary concerns. This psychological distance was initially there with COVID and we see it today with climate. I'm gonna show you some data from the United States, but I would just remind you as a non-American living in the US that what I've experienced is that in the US, the signal to noise ratio is just higher. In other countries, we have the same concerns and the same problems. We just have a lower signal to noise ratio. So you can see the conclusions more clearly in US focused data but we see the same trends in human behavior and opinions in other countries as well. So in the US, for example, when you ask people, is global warming happening? And you look at results by county, the vast majority say yes. But when you say, will it harm people personally? The vast majority say no. Of course, both COVID and climate change are public health crises. It's obvious how COVID is. We know with climate change though, first of all, it's caused by burning fossil fuels that the most recent estimate puts at 9 million deaths, premature deaths from air pollution per year from burning fossil fuels. Compare that with COVID, we just topped 3 million worldwide. So three times a COVID pandemic every year from the air pollution from burning fossil fuels. Of course, there's possible interactions between exposure to air pollution and vulnerability to COVID. And this is just the tip of the iceberg because when we look at climate change, there is a whole litany of ways that changing climate can directly or indirectly affect our health through heat related illnesses and death, exacerbating air pollution and allergies, making different types of weather disasters more severe or more frequent, increasing the risk of water contamination, the spread of disease, affecting our mental health, decreasing the nutritional content of our food through increasing CO2 levels, and ultimately increasing the risk of conflict and refugee crises. Not only that, but both COVID and climate change disproportionately affect those who are most vulnerable. We know from COVID that it's likely to push, and this is even here an old estimate, it's likely to push well over 100 million people into extreme poverty. And we already know that climate change is at work exacerbating the same inequalities. Two years ago before COVID, two of my colleagues at Stanford released a study where they had found that climate change had already increased the gap between the richest and poorest countries in the world by as much as 25% in some cases from 1960 until today. And then perhaps the worst part of this is that both of these issues rapidly become politicized when, as soon as policymakers look to scientists for guidance. Why and how this happens was actually described by Scottish philosopher David Hume 400 years ago. In a fascinating book called Scientists as Prophets by Linda Walsh, she talks about how Hume articulated very clearly that science explains what the current state of the world is, policy states what we ought to do about it. And the logical gap between the way it is and the way it ought to or should be cannot be bridged without values. So no matter how much data we have, 
values still stand in the way of effective policymaking. And this explains what a prescient book to read during the pandemic. This explains how even a simple statement of the way the world is, such as humans are causing climate change or wearing a mask prevents the spread of COVID, implies a response is needed and is therefore perceived to be political. And of course, the United States being what it, what, what it is, we saw this in the data almost immediately. In February 2020, before COVID really hit in North America, there obviously were cases already, but it was not widely known or understood, climate change was the most politically polarized issue in the whole country. The width of the gray bar shows how far apart people are depending on if they're conservative, Republican, or liberal, Democrat. By August, guess what had happened? Now these bars are not in order of the width of the gray bar, so I'm gonna point out number three, two, and one. The third most politicized issue was COVID. The second was race and ethnic inequality, and the first was still climate change. So when we saw medical professionals saying, as long as we just provide the facts to the people, they'll surely understand exactly what to do. You can see what climate scientists reaction was here. Unfortunately, we've been trying that for 200 years, maybe not 200 talking to the public, but certainly a full hundred. Now I mentioned earlier that the United States has a higher signal to noise ratio than other countries and analyses have borne this out. The trends that we see in the US exist across other countries. For example, across 56 nations, climate change beliefs, education and experience were dwarfed by values, ideologies, worldview and political orientation. A more recent study that just came out last October found that when people who self-identify as liberal are more educated, they become more concerned about climate change but in rich countries where people produce a lot of carbon, conservative ideology significantly attenuates that effect. And in the US, of course, being what it is, it reverses it. So turning to the positive then, if this is the negative, what works? Three things. First of all, we've seen that swift action works. We saw that swift action during the lockdowns reduced air pollution significantly. We saw that it's likely that these reductions in air pollution could have saved a number of lives. This is of course by the same Stanford um, scientists who did the analysis on the difference between poor and rich countries over time. We know too that during the month of April, carbon emissions dropped by 7%, 17% and globally they dropped by 7% around the world. And here's the interesting thing. If the changes that we had seen last April were permanent, a 17% reduction in our carbon emissions, we would have been about one third of the way to our 2030 one and a half degree goal at the global scale in just a few weeks. Just a few weeks. That is what swift action can accomplish. It's amazing. What else works? effective policies with co-benefits. What we are seeing today in the green recovery process is changes to our lifestyle that are good for us today, but that are also good for us tomorrow. Whether it's increasing pedestrian areas in major cities, whether it's having to report your climate impacts before you get COVID relief as in my home country of Canada, whether it's Air France and KLM having to reduce their carbon footprint, whether it's the fact that during the pandemic, renewable energy accounted for 90% of the new energy installed around the world, 90%. When we have policies that begin with an awareness of the values that people have, what will motivate people to support action? What motivates people to resist or challenge action? We need to understand these in advance rather than responding to them afterwards. We cannot any longer assume that just overwhelming people with an avalanche of information ensures support for constructive policies. And of course, we need to make sure the policies are based on sound science, we all agree on that, but we have to recognize that tension between sciences is, as philosopher Hume points out, and policies ought, how the world should be. Lastly, 
what works long term? Changing social norms. And we already saw this play out in the difference between various countries' response to COVID. Countries that were already conditioned towards collective rather than individual action. Countries also where people uh, were used to wearing masks. Beliefs about what others do and what others think we should do. These tiny little seemingly inconsequential things are what ultimately change our culture. Again, we saw this play out already with COVID, with different attitudes towards responses. But how do we trigger these changes? How do social norms actually change? They change primarily via something that every single one of us can do, but many of us aren't doing. What is that? To explain it, I'll just go back to these maps I showed earlier. We left off here. How many people think that global warming affects them personally? Not very many. But then there's two maps that are even darker blue. Do you ever talk about it? 35%. And do you ever hear about it in the media? 25%. Fascinatingly, we don't talk about something if we don't think it matters to us, we don't know how to communicate it to others, and we don't think there's anything positive we can do to fix it. And that is why it is so effective, believe it or not, the tiny little action of clearly communicating risks and advocating for practical solutions. Because that changes what people around us think. It changes our collective idea of the way the world ought to be. It changes our sense of whether anything can be accomplished by action. And that is ultimately what encourages us to act. I wanna leave you with a quote from a young person. He's the son of a man called Duncan Green who worked for many years with Oxfam. And in Duncan's book, he quotes his son, and this is what his son says. What climate change is for us, slavery was to them 200 years ago, a massive immovable object. Yet by being small cogs in a very large machine, they were able to make a difference. So while it's hard for us to see how we can possibly make a dent, we just have to remember it has been done before. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Ayo, for your introduction uh, into this session. Uh, before we move on to the next speaker, I have a one question uh, for you that was being based on this. Have we been guilty of, of underestimating the climate ch change problem and how we communicate about it by, by constantly using these a few degrees of warming um, as our main message? I think that we have been guilty of assuming that the reasons why we scientists are alarmed are sufficient to convince everyone else of the need for action. A recent study looked at, for example, BBC coverage of climate change, and they showed that most of the images that were used are images that invoke psychological distance. Arctic sea ice, Greenland, Antarctica, polar bears, things that have nothing to do with our lives where we live. People often say, oh, it's just a few degrees, but if our child's temperature goes up a few degrees, we are taking them to the doctor or the hospital. So we have to only assumed that everybody thinks like we do. And of course, the reality is that they don't. Most people do not think like scientists do. And that I think is the importance of clearly communicating the risks and advocating for practical, sensible solutions that can be enacted today. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this. We're coming back to you, of course, in the panel discussion. Anyone that's watching this live stream, watching this session, you're very welcome to put in questions in the Q&A and we will address them at the end when all speakers have had a chance to, uh, to say their say. Which means that we're moving on to our, our second speaker and our second speaker is Dr. Andrea Hinwood and she is the Chief Scientist of the United Nations Environment Program. Um, her career has included providing strategic advice to governmental organizations on a wide variety of environmental matters, um, including ozone depleting, air quality, fire and smoke management, biodiversity impacts, emerging contaminants. And what might be interesting to know for the geoscientific audience today, uh, she has also earned her stripes doing her field work, uh, including measuring arsenic concentrations in the hair and toenails of residents living in areas with high environmental arsenic concentrations. Uh, Dr. Hinboot, please address your fellow scientists. 
Thanks very much. You really did look up the internet to find out what my background was. Okay, um, thanks everyone. And it's a privilege to actually be joining you today. I'm just trying to load my presentation and hopefully we'll, we'll be away. So I'm going to say some similar things uh, to Catherine. The United Nations uh, is talking about three planetary crises. That is climate change, that is biodiversity and nature loss, and pollution and waste. And I guess today's topic, we're dealing with uh, climate change and ecological emergencies. And I just want to talk about what the United Nations and UNEP strategic objectives are for the future. It's to attain climate stability, where net zero greenhouse gas emissions and resilience in the face of climate change are achieved, that we live in harmony with nature, where humanity prospers in harmony with nature, and towards a pollution-free planet where pollution is prevented and controlled, and that we have good environmental quality and we have health and well-being um, for all. And we've just seen from Catherine's slides the impact of uh, poor air quality on populations. And I think the point here is that these three uh, big issues are all combined. It's not just climate change. Pollution and waste impacts on climate change. Declining biodiversity and impacts on nature also impact on climate change, and they also impact on our ability to mitigate the effects of climate change. So I, I wanted just to show you this image from uh, the emissions gap report, uh, which, which is actually demonstrating um, greenhouse gas emissions, not, not impact, but emissions under different scenarios and where we're actually sitting in terms of what we need to do to have or, or to achieve a two degree above um, pre-industrial levels or to achieve the 1.5 degree scenario that we've got. It's clearly obvious we are not on track uh, to meet that at this point in time. Even more importantly, we, we need probably much more rapid implementation and if that we want to achieve our targets by 2030, we're actually going to have to do better and we're going to have to deal with 45% reduction in emissions by 2030 compared with our 2010 emissions. We've got some way to go. Yesterday, the WMO released their 2020 report for um, climate change and we had our warmest decade on record and 2020, despite having El Nino, was also one of the warmest years on record. And that's in spite of seeing some of these reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. I wanted to put this slide up in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, just to demonstrate again that they have risen 1.4% over the last decade, but also to see where the major contributors are in terms of fossil fuels, but also have a look at that methane um, increase over time as well. And last year, uh, NOAA was actually reporting that we had one of our largest uh, measured methane uh, events, which is interesting in a year with significant uh, restrictions in place. And there is uh, some reports that are going to come out about how we might be able to deal with methane uh, in a fairly um, opportunistic way, but also will, which will have some significant impacts. And I just wanted to, to also talk about bending the curve. During COVID, we've talked about flattening the curve. I want to talk about bending the curve in relation to biodiversity loss. To this point, we're seeing reductions in the extent of suitable habitat. We're seeing reductions in wildlife population density, compositional intactness in the ecosystems. And we're, we're experiencing one in eight extinctions. Uh, at risk at the moment, and that's without the increase in temperature and global change events that are occurring. Bending the curve shows us what is possible. And again, by looking at the different issues and looking at reforestation, restoration of ecosystems, etc., we can actually turn this around and have positive impacts for populations and for climate change and overall ecosystem health. So as, as Catherine said as well, what did we observe during COVID restrictions? We did see swift response to control the spread and to mitigate social and economic impacts. We actually did all of those things. We put it on an emergency footing. The response was largely based on science and risk. 
and we've continued to provide early warning and trend data. We demonstrated we can take local, national and coordinated international action relatively quickly to do some of the things we did in the, in the time frame we did it was actually quite remarkable. And we've also contributed enormous funds. Most countries have contributed funds and we're approaching 17 trillion US dollars. We demonstrated a willingness to protect public health. And I know that there are, there's lots of variability in this space across the globe, but there was an overall willingness to protect public health. If we're talking about climate change, we also need to talk about that protection of public health and what it means for individuals. We shared information and we co-created. We created vaccines. We've got several options available, despite current debates about their efficacy and issues with them. That was a remarkable achievement. We also made lifestyle changes really quickly. And personally, for someone who likes to be out there with people, I did adapt to working at home on my computer day after day. And it's shown us we can have some positive impacts on the environment as well. As noted, we saw some reductions in greenhouse um, gas emissions. We had quite a, a substantial decline, but we've also had a very swift rebound. And of course, we're still tracking up in terms of our, our greenhouse gas emissions. We saw improvements in air quality, but we've also seen, seen a rebound with economies um, cranking back into action. We had anecdotal observations of improvements in species diversity in areas which did not have um, human pressure anymore. And, but we also saw increased uh, use of uh, single use plastics and medical waste. We saw increases in domestic household use, biofuels in particular areas, and actually some of that was measurable at scale. And we saw increases in domestic wastewater and in some locations poor poor water quality. So where we reduced industrial contributions to wastewater, we saw some improvements, but where we saw domestic wastewater that might impact on the environment, we saw poorer uh, water quality as a result of some of our systems. Building back better. Everyone's talking about building back better and uh, spending money, taking account of long-term economic, environmental and social considerations. But I think what we've observed, and um, thanks to the Global Recovery Observatory for their live database on this information regarding um, spending, in 2020, only 18% of recovery spending and 2.5% of total spending had positive green characteristics. So the COVID-19 crisis will only contribute significantly to 2030 emissions reductions if we incorporate strong decarbonisation. And I think that's something that we need to pay a lot of attention to and very quickly. As I said before, we probably need to have significant reductions in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 to meet a 2050 net zero carbon target. We really need to promote um, nature-based solutions, uh, restoration, recovery of natural systems, and for example, if we actually focused on uh, efficiency of buildings, energy efficiency, UNEP's done some research on buildings and actually shown that buildings and construction sector accounted for 38% of total carbon dioxide emissions. To get on track by 2050, we could actually building back, looking at energy efficiency and make some substantial um, uh, inroads in that. So in my view, how can the COVID pandemic help? We respond really well to emergencies. We need to put our three planetary crises, we do call them emergencies, on that emergency footing, but people actually need to realise it's important. There's time to build back better um, because there are still many outstanding decisions around how we actually uh, generate the COVID-19 economic recovery. The social co-benefits or positives of carefully designed green policies can make a difference to health outcomes. And I don't think we're factoring in the benefits of some of these changes in terms of the health uh, and the cost of health in the future if we don't do anything. There are many options for reducing personal emissions and governments have shown they can use incentives provided through government policies, legislation, investments very well. But I guess my most important message is, I think we need to change the conversation. And I think we need to change the conversation to be positive. 
to not talk about how negative everything is, but what we can positively do to change outcomes, to use science and evidence, and to discuss risk and associated costs to drive the reticence in action. So in my view, the responses to climate and ecological crises is possible, achievable, and COVID has actually shown us that we can do that. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Andrea, for uh, for addressing us. Um, I had one question listening to you. Uh, you talked about way more impacts that humans have on the Earth system than just climate change uh, in isolation. Is it is it time we start talking about total impact of humans on the planet, maybe even human abuse of the planet? I don't know whether I'd call it human abuse of the planet. I think that's probably a bit strong and very negative connotations. But I do think that these three crises that we talk about are interrelated. We can have some significant benefits if we restore degraded landscapes, if we prevent reductions in biodiversity, if we actually look at pollution and waste, because they are also associated with greenhouse gas emissions, if we look at the, the activities in an integrated way and the sustainable development goals are actually established to help us do that, I think we will have a lot more impact because people in where they live have seen the changes to the environment where they live. And if you relate it to what people's experience is on the ground, then you do actually get at what they can see and what they can feel and therefore what it means to them to actually change. Okay, I, I thank you for that answer. It nicely relates to the psychological distancing that Professor Heo just talked about. Um, for anyone that has questions, if you have a question and you see a similar question, you can upvote or down, no, not downvote, you can upvote questions in the Q&A. Uh, that of course makes it more likely that that question will get asked in the, in the panel discussion. Um, and we will be moving on to our third speaker, who is Mr. Mike Berry. Uh, he currently has many roles in helping businesses become more sustainable. He is a strategic advisor for uh, Instinctive Partners and Climate Invest and a board trustee of a Blueprint for Better Business. He has his own consulting uh, company called Mike Berry Eco. Um, but before all this, Mr. Berry was the director of sustainable business at Marks and Spencers, the large British uh, supermarket chain. I may be underselling Marks and Spencers here as a non-UK person. Um, in that role, he thought up and implemented the award-winning Plan A, because there is no Plan B, and Plan A helped uh, Marks and Spencers to achieve zero waste to landfill status, switch to 100% renewable electricity, and achieve carbon neutrality across its UK-wide stores, offices, and warehouses. Mr. Berry, please tell our geoscientific audience what we can learn from your experience. Thank you very much, Rolf. And uh, again, I, I will just share some briefly some slides with you. And again, I'm a shopkeeper. We've heard some amazing scientific presentations about the role of the pandemic and the role of the climate crisis and how what we can learn from each other. I'm going to put a business frame on that briefly over the next 10 minutes. And I'm going to talk about seven big trends that I'm seeing in business that can help us accelerate the action we need on the climate crisis. And I want to be very clear with you at the beginning. Business is the problem. Business is causing the unsustainable use of resources on the planet. Business is causing the climate crisis. The disproportionate amount of the emissions come from business activity. And as Catherine's already told us, just like governments, business is short term in its thinking. It's atomized. It doesn't think about systems. It thinks about individual things, an individual shop, an individual factory, an individual farm. And all that has failed miserably during the pandemic and it's failing during the climate crisis as well. So let me just briefly introduce the seven things I'm going to talk about very, very briefly in the next few minutes. I'm going to talk about how the sustainability of the climate crisis is reinventing business sectors. It's no longer a reputational issue that you faced a bad day in the, the Guardian or the New York Times if you got things wrong. This is fundamentally your business now. I'll talk about the rise of the net zero economy, how we're starting to understand that it's our consumption behaviours. Again, we've heard about that already from previous speakers. Our consumption behaviours drive the climate crisis. I'll talk about well-being. Now, what is good for the person, individual is good for the planet too. I won't forget the social issue as well. How can business be a good citizen? I'll talk about partnership. No one can solve this on their own. 
and the power of technology for good to solve the challenges we have today. I want to start with a really big point. For the last 40 years, business has had its, its own way. Globalization as we know it has seen business face low taxes, low regulations, be able to produce and sell what it wants, where it wants. Now, some businesses might complain about that, but that's how it's been. That's coming to an end now. And it was coming to an end before the pandemic, but the pandemic has accelerated that. The climate crisis is accelerating it. You can reach back to the financial crisis of 2008 when the banks and business were bailed out by society while everybody else suffered. We cannot carry on with the system we have today. So I want to be very clear that the pandemic is the last nail in the coffin of globalization 1.0. We need a new system. So the way I'm going to start with is this point about Big Bang. I've grown up in a world where businesses worried about a bit of reputational damage from an NGO attack. It was a bad day in the office for one day, then it's gone. Now, if you get it wrong, you're out of business. And we're seeing that already in two big industrial sectors. You'll have heard the statistics. Tesla is now worth more than every other car company on the planet put together because it saw the shift and the need for low carbon mobility before anybody else. Everybody else thought with diesel and petrol was forever. Tesla saw the opportunity. And of course, this graph that shows the valuation of the uh, world's biggest energy companies. Just 10 years ago, ExxonMobil was the most valuable company on the planet, bar none. Today, its valuation is close to being overtaken by next era, the world's biggest renewables company. So in two sectors already, we're seeing those that sleepwalk into the climate crisis and not just causing it, they'll be destroyed ultimately by it. Good. We ne they need to be replaced. The third sector that is sleepwalking into it now is the food sector. And again, that will be the subject of a presentation in its own right that we don't have time to today. But already we're seeing both the food sector as a source for emissions, being impacted by climate change and new models for producing food emerging very rapidly. As I say, a discussion for another day. The second thing I'll just mention is very quickly, businesses having to realize that this is not about becoming 2% less bad every year in the way that it did reducing its carbon emissions in the past. This is about fundamentally changing every aspect of your business. And I work for a small retailer. Marks and Spencer was a thousand shops, supported by 2000 factories producing goods for it, supported by 20,000 farmers producing fruits, vegetables, meat, flowers, and wine, and behind them thousands of raw material sources, fish, cotton, palm oil, cocoa, soy, selling to 32 million customers. That small, Walmart is 25 times bigger than Marks and Spencer. Do the math. So if you're going to change every element of that, you need to understand that legally it's required. And brilliant that we're now starting to see the law emerge from Europe, South Korea, Japan, China, soon Australia, and the USA as well. It is mandated in legislation. At last, investors are asking the companies they invest into to change. We're seeing that businesses are having to adapt, not just cut their emissions in the scope one and two, their own operations, but the critically important scope three emissions, those great supply chains I mentioned a moment ago, that drive the emissions and the consumer use of your product. Science-based targets to underpin it and only offsetting residual emissions at the end of that journey. You must cut your emissions first. This is all new to most businesses. A few voluntary businesses like Unilever understood this years ago and have done it voluntarily. Most businesses are scrabbling into the 2020s, blinking their eyes at this new requirement to do business. So the third thing I'm going to talk about very briefly is this concept of consumption. We've talked about sustainable production in the past, better factories, better farms, better lorries behind the scenes. But for 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet, they consume stuff, or those of us that are lucky enough to be rich enough to do so. And there's more of us every year. Coca-Cola serves 700 billion servings of its drinks around the world every year. The world consumed before the pandemic 130 billion pieces of clothing and footwear in one year. Walmart probably sells 100 billion items per year. It is all about stuff. The number of flights we take, the number of holidays, the number of cars, the amount of foods we consume, the amount of meat, it's all about stuff. So business is starting to have to rapidly look around it and ask the question of the people that consume from it, do you really care? And the Catherine's done a great job at sort of, but at a societal level, helping us understand, yes, they do, but it's a great way of engaging. What business is starting to understand is that people want everything. They want great products at great prices, great experiences, but they want you to address climate change as well. These studies, all of them keep coming back to a single number. 70% of people in most marketplaces want business to take 
climate change seriously. And increasingly, people are linking these great global problems that we're seeing from the Amazon to the Arctic with their day-to-day -day decisions. That, that coffee cup, did you need it that you threw away? Every time you do that, it's got an impact. It's slow, it's not fast enough, but people are linking their lives to the big picture. And of course, we ask this question about a generational divide. You know, I'm an old man now. Do my generation really care? Well, they do care, surprisingly much. What they don't have to do, have the confidence or the skills to do something about it. That's what the younger generation has. And they're becoming the dominant force in the employment market, the investment market, and of course, the consumption market too. And here we're seeing great products emerge. The Tesla car, the alternative to meat, or birds trainers. They are the most sustainable option in the marketplace, but are also things that people desire and want to buy as well. So the fourth issue I'm seeing in business is this linking of good for the individual and good for the planet. And we've mentioned it already cut through the previous speakers. Again, we're seeing the rapid personalization of food, diet, medical care. Again, the pandemic has, has accelerated it. The concept of a well-being plate, good for the planet, good for you as an individual. There is one diet as well. So the concept of well-being is going to drive change in business. As well. Now, I don't want to forget that in all the sort of scurrying around that big business is doing on net zero now, it has to be a good citizen. And frankly, I don't see enough ambition here. I've seen some good response in crisis from business in the pandemic. Good. But it's been short term risk management, just like it wants to make sure there's enough children in factories overseas. It wants to make sure it doesn't poison anybody with its food or kill somebody on a building site. It's risk management. There needs to be the same level of social ambition that we're starting to see in the business environmentally. And again, whether it's the just transition, making sure that oil rig workers can retrain to work on offshore wind farms, that beef farmers are prepared to farm carbon in the soil, we have to make sure that people feel that they can win from the transition. Business has to have a point of view. It's difficult, it's politicised. You've seen that in the state, particularly in the last few years. But business has to stand up for what is right. Business needs to pay its taxes to fund all the transition that we need as well. So all around us, business needs to be good, a good citizen. And then of course, business can't just win alone. It's grown up trying to beat its competitor. Now Coca-Cola and Pepsi have to work together on the climate challenge. Nestle and Unilever, Tesco's and Walmart, huge competitors, but only by working together can you fundamentally shift the, the climate crisis. We're seeing it already in terms of retail, which is retailers working together on net zero, We've seen it with the Climate Friend Pledge in terms of Amazon bringing sort of partners together all the way across the world to work together on this. We're seeing it from Climate Action 100 Plus, a bunch of investors with over $50 trillion of asset under management collectively asking for change from big business, the businesses that cause the carbon emissions. The penultimate point as well. So then just finish off with a quick reflection on tools. I talked about a business I worked for that had sold 3 billion items a year. I try, try to track and trace those in supply chains around the world to make them better with a pen, a paper, an abacus and a spreadsheet. I've got grey hair for a reason, it's difficult. Now with artificial intelligence and big data, you can start to track and trace all these problems and put them right. So finally, we've got a suite of tools that if we use wisely, we can transform a business footprint for the better. So let me just finish. We're coming to the end of a 40 year cycle of globalisation. The pandemic has finished off. There are, of course, difficult discussions and problems that reach into the future. But I, as a businessman, now see several sectors and many companies going to their death because they've not responded to the climate crisis quick enough. Good. But I also see the opportunity to drive change in behaviours. Again, we've spoken about it repeatedly in these presentations. We need to do things differently, but we can only do it if we offer people great solutions, great cars, great foods, great holiday that also fundamentally more sustainable too. Thank you for listening for a little bit of a different discussion about the climate crisis. Thank you very much, Mr. Berry, for your, for your point of view, that, which is completely different, I guess, from most people uh, in the audience. I think most people in the audience have a background somewhere in academia, in research. And what I'd like to ask you is, um, you're apparently obviously someone who's very good at getting people to stand up and motivate them to make changes within the business environment and take action on that. For decades now, scientists have been highlighting the climate crisis. Um, we could say with seemingly little effect if I'm being really cynical. 
um, from your outside perspective, are, are universities and research institute fit for purpose to be those addressing the climate and ecological crisis? Well, it's a really good question, Wolf. And I think scientists have to be scientists. I don't want scientists to be co-opted by big business or by government. Scientists are there to provide us with the facts. And we've already heard about the, the gap between this is how things are, the facts, and this is the decisions that policymakers and business leaders now need to make on the back of those. So this is not about a problem of science. This is about a problem of business and policy, ignoring the science and not responding to it. There's probably a way that actually scientists could have worked with businesses earlier in the cycle to get us to do some of the heavy lifting of pushing government and consumers and citizens to change and develop the solutions quicker. But this is no fault of scientists. This is my I, responsibility as a business leader. That, that relieves me and I hope a lot of people in the audience that it's, it's not our fault. And I think I, I like the bridge that you make towards uh, policy because that nicely introduced our final speaker uh, for today, who is Mr. David Mayer. He is the head of the unit called Knowledge for Policy at the European Commission Joint Research Center. His unit, uh, with him as one of the authors, has written the report, Understanding Our Political Nature and How to Put Knowledge and Reason at the Heart of Political Decision Making. Um, I've been going through that last weekend and I can advise any scientist that wants to interface with policy to have a read at least at the executive summary, but probably at the entire report. Mr. Mayor, the floor is yours to enlighten us why it's so hard for science facts to influence science policy. Thanks very much, Rolf, and thanks to the EGU for this opportunity to talk about our work. In, in case you don't know the JRC, we are the science and knowledge service of the European Commission. So we're an integral part of the European Commission, but our job is to try and bring scientific evidence into the EU policymaking process. So we have laboratories and research projects and publications in high ranking journals and all of that, and partnerships with scientific bodies around the world. But at the same time, we have, if you like, a double life. And by day, we also sit in on policy formulation meetings uh, inside the European Commission and advise on draft legislation, impact assessments, evaluations, and all these sorts of things. So uh, we're known by this dreadful phrase, we're a, a boundary spanning in organization. We, we sit in the scientific community, but we also sit inside the executive uh, branch of the European Union and get called on to, to bring the best of uh, scientific knowledge into the policymaking process. And it's the job of my particular team to study that particular problem. Why is it so hard to bring scientific evidence to bear on policy and political questions? And what can we in practice do about it? Uh, and so therefore the report you mentioned sets out our, our basic theory of, of why it is so hard and some practical ideas of, of how we want to do this. And we're very pleased to work with EGU in a number of uh, areas to try and help scientists, not just only within our organization, but more generally. So if you go and look at our uh, website, you will find also we have a handbook on how to bring science into policy. We have a free uh, online quick sort of uh, taster course for researchers wondering about first steps in influencing policy. Uh, we're also working with the EGU to train up some EGU members, I think, to become great trainers in training scientists. Uh, and we see part of our role as very much supporting the skill development of scientists in trying to influence politics uh, and policy making, because there is no more urgent and important task, I think, we're going to need science massively to solve climate change and other problems, but it is also very complex and difficult. And I think uh, COVID, to, to go back to the subject of this, of this panel, has, has really exemplified how, how difficult it is to bring science to bear in, in policymaking in ways which we thought we had a clue, but I think has, has really uh, exemplified the, the challenges, because in many ways there are similarities between the pandemic and climate change. Uh, COVID is like climate change, a full spectrum policy problem. It's gonna need all the scientific disciplines and it has 
touched COVID pretty much every single area of public policy you care to name. And I think climate change falls into the same category of we're going to need all the knowledge and it's going to need to be deployed in pretty much every uh, policy area. So, um, and I think we have learned some lessons. We, we, uh, the European Commission is, 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 has certainly been involved in policy making on COVID, but of course, national governments have also played an absolutely essential role. So we in the JRC have played our part in trying to bring science into various EU level policy questions. And uh, we're of course very far from learning any definitive lessons on this, but we do have some emerging lessons which tie back into the report you mentioned. And the first point I'd like to pick up is, is, is on what Catherine said. And I think this is an incredibly important point. Uh, the distinction between what is and what ought to be first raised by David Hume. Uh, we have to be absolutely clear that uh, solving climate change is a policy problem, it's a policy challenge. And science by definition cannot solve a policy problem, a political problem. Science can solve a science problem. It can't solve a policy problem. Uh, and so we have to be clear what science can and cannot do. Science is, is indispensable to provide the knowledge we need, but it cannot answer the questions about what we should do or, or what we ought to do. It, that's simply uh, outside its scope. And I think that's a very important uh, jumping off point into this debate. And I think Catherine got it right that uh, the values are there. And values and indeed the related concept of identities are absolutely fundamental because it is that people's values and identities that will determine what they want the ought to be, what they want the policy to be. Uh, and therefore, when it comes to COVID or climate change, I think COVID has shown very clearly that even with a, a you could say perhaps a quite a sort of straightforward problem, you know, no one was saying the virus is a good thing, let it spread. Every, everyone was everyone was pretty clear that we needed to stop the virus and eliminate the virus. There wasn't a great deal of differences between what people around the world wanted. But nevertheless, you began to see that there were very important values differences between how people wanted to go about solving the problems raised by COVID. And that, I think, is an important message coming out of some work we are doing on the science of values and identities, is that there will always be a plurality of values in our society. People will are going to have different opinions about what we should do about things, and they are going to have different opinions about what we should do about climate change and particularly how we should go about it. And no amount of science is going to make those differences about what we do go away. And no amount of wishing they would go away and people would just agree on something because the science said so is going to make them go away. We have no other choice but to recognize that people want different things or want to go about solving climate change in different ways. We need to understand the full diversity of them, respect them and grind through these differences to build the compromise where people feel that their values have been uh, understood and properly taken into account. And the really, really difficult thing about this is what the psychologists tell us about my side bias, which is a very particular bias. And it's a bias that comes to any of our thinking when we are thinking about things we care about, matters of conviction or matters which touch upon our very identity. When it comes to these things, my side bias means that we have enormous difficulty in accepting facts that challenge our core convictions and our identity. And what is so interesting about this bias is, is that many biases are mitigated by IQ or by thinking style, open-mindedness. My side bias is an outlier where it is not mitigated by IQ or open-minded thinking styles. So whoever you are, if you really care about something passionately, you have convictions on it, or it's close to your identity, you are going to struggle to hunt out evidence that says you're wrong. And when you meet with evidence that says you're wrong, you are going to struggle to accept this. And this applies to policymakers, politicians, people in the, in the street, but it also applies to scientists. So I think that's one of the another important message from our report is that Rather than pretending scientists are presenting their views from nowhere and the white coat shows that they are entirely value free, is to accept that the science is not itself value free, that all the choices we make about what to research, which facts to present, which order, when, 
These are based on our own values considerations, and that's fine. We just need to be upfront and clear about them and honest and transparent about the values. Uh, and then also we need to therefore make greater efforts to understand in particular people who have different values to us. It's really hard to empathize with people with different values. We're, we want, we desperately all want to win our values battles and therefore trying to learn how to empathize with other people's values is very hard, but we're not going to do it. We're not going to succeed in getting people either to accept the underpinning science or to agree on some sort of way forward that we can all live with unless we are able to demonstrate this values empathy and learn new techniques uh, about how to um, uh, about how to reach compromises uh, when we have legitimate differences uh, of opinion. Um, I think there's some also important lessons come out of COVID for scientists in that uh, the discourse of science, uh, I, I'm not a scientist myself, but when I came to work in a scientific organization, I was a little bit surprised at the tone of scientific discourse. Scientists don't take many prisoners when they debate with each other, they really don't. And that's great for the scientific process. I think in front of the public, public citizens can sometimes infer different things about the perhaps slightly intemperate nature of scientific discourse. We know there are going to be differences of science opinion, great or small. And therefore I think uh, one challenge for scientists is to, is to enable a mode of discourse where humility and respect around disagreement in the public sphere can be cultivated. Uh, and this in particular, I think has been exposed by, by COVID is that, is that this is such a sort of multi-dimensional problem that we're going to need many, many different disciplines. And I've never come across a scientist who's an expert in all the disciplines. So it seems to me, humility when stepping outside your area and engaging with all the disciplines is going to be a core competence and a, a skill that scientists can learn in, in learning to play nice in public discourse about science. And the last thing I want to mention is that um, even if scientists and policymakers and politicians wrap this all up nicely behind closed doors and come up with perfect solutions they can all agree with, it won't fly with citizens. Neither the science will fly nor the resulting solutions. So we're gonna to have to get serious about new deliberative and participatory techniques to bring citizens into both the process of the construction of the knowledge base and informing the research topics that are researched, but also in terms of uh, thinking about the solutions. We know how to do that. There is a wonderful deliberative wave of these tools across the European Union, across the world. Yesterday, the European Commission launched a cutting edged public deliberation tool to think about the future of Europe, including climate questions where citizens can discuss these things with each other in 24 languages simultaneously translated. These are the kind of things we're all gonna to need to get used to, to bringing scientists in. So, so that's it from me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for this uh, elaboration on how your world works and uh, why it doesn't always work the way we may have wanted to. Um, I have one question for you as well before we move on uh, to the central panel um, part of the session and that would be that I always wonder how much of the pol political decision making process that you're in the center of sometimes is being influenced by public opinion and so if we as scientists want to make sure that um, our science is used as a basis for decision making I'm not saying what it ought to be, but at least providing the facts what it is. Should we focus in communicating on the public, as some people would advocate, or should we focus on communicating more with politicians, civil servants, and institutes, if our focus is on getting policy, uh, getting our science into policy? It's not an either or, Rolf. It's, it's got to be a both, uh, because uh, all the politicians I've ever worked closely with are incredibly sensitive to public opinion and actually the views of voters they meet uh, on the street. And they tend to be all the politicians I met, even much, much better th than career civil servants who don't have to get elected. So I, th I think it absolutely has to be both. And actually the mode of discourse for scientists when talking to policymakers and talking to citizens is not terribly 
different actually so uh, even if it you do have to therefore you know put a few more dates in your diary the kind of messages you're passing but also actually the fundamental skill of listening and that's that's my one standard but go-to advice for for scientists seeking to influence policy do not start with what you know start with asking what the politician or the citizen or the policymaker wants to know ask them what's on their desk and then seek to present your research as an answer to their question rather to present your research as an answer to a question that perhaps they don't have thank you thank you so much for that and i think that's very valuable advice for many uh, scientists looking forward to communicate um, we're going to move on to the panel discussion part of this session. Um, there have been a lot of questions in the Q&A. If during this panel discussion, you and the audience have a follow-up question or another question, please put it in the Q&A. If it's very similar to a question already posed, please upvote that question, which gives us a better chance of addressing that one. And then um, for the panelists, there's a raise hand button if you feel like you want to react to uh, what one of your fellow panelists is uh, saying, please use that function so that I can move the virtual mic around. Um, if I hear something that sparks a bridge, then I will, of course, do that myself. And I think the first thing that I want to address is a question from uh, Catherine Jacks. Oh, up front, I'm going to apologize to anyone in the audience if I mispronounce names. I'm very sorry. I'm Dutch. Um, first is a, a question by Catherine Jacks that asks after a COVID, after a year of COVID constantly dominating all headlines how can we force the climate emergency on the agenda of editors and media outlets and politicians minds um uh, professor heyo do you have an opinion on that i definitely do so one of the biggest problems we have when it comes to climate change is one that i suffered from myself as a student the idea that climate change is a niche issue it is an environmental issue that environmentalists care about, environmentalists work on, and the rest of us wish them well. So if you tell a story about climate change, it's an environmental story that belongs in the environmental section once a week at most. That is the biggest misconception we have. The reason I became a climate scientist was because I took a class when I was just finishing my undergraduate uh, degree that showed me that climate change is in fact an everything issue. Climate change affects every aspect of our lives on this planet. It affects the air that we breathe, as I and others talked about. It affects the water we drink, the food we eat. It affects the economy, business, jobs, national security. It affects the places where we live. It affects everything we already care about. And so honestly, at this point, it is hard to write a story without having some aspect of climate change in it, whether it's about gardening or outdoor sports, where the, what about the Olympics? How are they gonna protect the athletes from heat there? Whether it's talking about what's happening to our weather or our water, what's happening in other countries, what's happening where we live. I was listening to the BBC right after Prince Philip's funeral actually, and it was really interesting that in a half hour news program, three of the world's stories in a half hour were about climate change, but they were very different. Some were economic, some were impact-based. I think things are starting to change where people now realize that climate change is an everything issue. And if reporters are having problems pitching it to an editor who says, oh, that's just a niche issue, an environment issue. The answer is no, it's about real people and real places and real issues that matter to every single one of us today. Does that, does that mean that if we as scientists wanna communicate our story uh, broadly outside of the scientific community, that we should pitch it as something else than an environmental story? 100%. An environmental story creates that psychological distance such that only people who see themselves as environmentalists would care about it. And what's even more horrifying is the last time I went to Google and I Googled environmentalist a year ago last Earth Day, Google gave me eight photos. Of those eight photos, seven were men, White. four were dead, and four had very large beards. So <laughs> we have a sense that environmentalists are only a certain type of person and they care about it and nobody else does. Whereas the reality is to care about climate change, we only have to be one thing. And that is a human being living on planet earth and we are every single one of us that. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, uh, Dr. Inwood, would you like to react on that from your point of view? 
because you've done research on human impact that's so broad. Yeah, I, and, and I guess I, I do have a, a slightly different perspective because I have been, yeah, well, I guess it's a panel discussion and we've got differences. Um, I've, I've worked with a lot of communities, mainly with pollution and waste type issues. And my, I guess from my experience, across doing surveys of general members of the public, they are all interested in the environment and they're all talking about changes to their climate and what they see. And importantly, because I've worked for a regulator in the past, what am I doing about it? So I actually think that the interest has been there for a long period of time, but it's been under the surface. And I also think it's about how we talk about it though. If we continue to say, we're gonna lose this, you know, we're gonna have death and mayhem and people just start to switch off. So this is why I talk about changing the conversation because we are able to switch it to what we can do, which is positive, which people can then relate to themselves and their lives. So I, I think that we actually got a lot of momentum and a lot of interest in it. And it's the way we communicate it that is becoming more important and that we communicate the risks effectively so that we get action. Thank you. And um, I think that links to uh, Mr. Berry's work, because um, you say you have to focus on how it can improve uh, their lives. I think that uh, businesses play a role there. You've, you've talked about uh, kind of co-creation where you create value for people um, whilst doing sustainable actions. There is a concern in the chat, though, in, in the questions, though, that businesses, by their nature, if they focus on a profit and if the uh, cost of environmental unsustainable action is not addressed within that profit, are they actually, given how we structure businesses that are capable of providing that positive um, value that uh, Dr. Hinwood just uh, addressed? So it's, a, it's a brilliant question. Let, let's face into it. Business is far from perfect. Business has got us into the crisis we have today. So why should we have confidence that business will get out of it, it gets out of it? First, we need to start with the policy system. And I'm saying as a business leader that's grown up in a cycle of relatively light regulation over the last 20 or 30 years, we need more policy. It needs to be smart policy, long-term policy. But once the business knows that it's got a high hurdle to leap, it'll innovate and find ways around it. So things like a price on carbon, let's tax the polluters out of the marketplace and reward the ones with low carbon solutions out there. So I absolutely support the need for strong policy, but that's not enough. We must excite people. We can't just tell them this, this is about the end of the world. We need to give them exciting options. And I, I, I use a smattering of examples, whether it's the Tesla car, the old bird sneakers, the, the impossible or Memphis meats uh, alternatives to, to, to a meat-based diet. And all the research I've seen said there are two groups of people in the middle of society that really matters to us on this. 35% of people who are what we call light green consumers. They're really worried about all the issues we're talking about today, but they want to live a good life. And provided that we can find, help them find a way of having a good, entertaining, exciting life, and it's more sustainable, they'll come with us. And again, the electric car, beautifully made by Tesla, is the best example. But there's another group, another group of 35% who don't care about consumption as a pathway out of where we are today. They utterly care about their locality of where they were born. I was born in Mumbai. I'll live in Mumbai, I'll die in Mumbai. What's anybody doing here? So we need both a policy solution, we need a product and consumption solution, but we also have to talk to people where they actually live their lives. And again, I think that's been a recurring theme across the panel as well. But let's finish by being very clear. This is not about leaving this to the free market. The free market has got us to where we are now, but it's about tapping into the free market within a policy framework to give us the solutions we need. So that is, is a nice segue into, of course, Mr. Mayor's uh, um, experience. Um, and what I'd like to, to grab from you, your comment is, uh, for example, a, a carbon tax is highly discussed. Um, 
And people with vastly different values value the implementation of a carbon tax differently. Mr. Mayor, how would you reflect on that? Is that something that, um, well, wh where is the is and the ought um, relating to implementing a carbon tax? I think we have to do better at understanding what is driving different opinions on uh, a carbon tax and get to the bottom of those things. And then inevitably, when you want to build a consensus on a particular issue, you need to put together a compromise, which all the distinct possible positions on a carbon tax, uh, and there'll be a spectrum of opinions based on a spectrum of different values, that you have properly understood them, understand what they're aiming at and tried to address them. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily you give something for everyone because that doesn't create in the end a, a balanced proposal. But at least you have properly taken into account all the different opinions. You've done your best to put together something that commands uh, a consensus. And for those points which you, those arguments and values concerns that in the end you ultimately decide to override, you have uh, given people good reason and cause and argument. You've listened to their argument, you've addressed it, their concerns. That's, that's the only way forward I can see to deal with this. Uh, so to understand the, the full diversity of the opinions, because one of the strange things about values is, is, is they're not exactly black and white. We all have some sympathy with all the main values to different degrees. And they do all, uh, they're all connected with each other a bit as well. So there is a sort of underlying basis of, of common ground on values. And it's the question I'm, the work I'm pleading for is that we work a bit harder to try and uncover that uh, because we don't naturally do that because our own value set, we feel so viscerally and powerfully and we struggle so much to put ourselves in the shoes of people with different values. But so if to, we can, I think there's potential there. So to bring that back to the topic of this session, there's a question from Chris Holloway that relates to this, Mr. Mayor, which is, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has increased people's tendency to, to think collectively? Um, I think, I, I, I don't really know. I don't, I'm not enough of a scholar on that thing to really know the answer to that. My guess and my hope is that these underlying values we have are in the nature of general dispositions and how they play out in a given political context. There's a bit of a margin for change, but they don't fundamentally change. What, what the values research appears to suggest is that our, our deep underlying guiding values, they don't change so much over our life, they're reasonably pretty stable. Uh, so my, my speculation, it's frankly speculation, would be that that doesn't fundamentally uh, change, but uh, we can always, uh, what we have to do is to think about how these values play out in a given political context with a given political issue. And that there, the kaleidoscope of political events is always turning and always changing. And these values do not determine automatically what our views are going to be on any particular issue. There's plenty to play for in the way that issues are framed and discussed uh, and are relevant. Okay, well, thank you. I think this also relates to um the the work of Professor Heyo, because um, it sounds to me, but I might be wrong, that these underlying values are pretty fixed for a person. Whereas Professor Heyo, you've been known to change people's values. Um, or <laughs> so, <laughs> is it the role of a scientist to change these values, or is or am I completely getting it wrong? And please correct me. Oh, so so no, I very much agree with David. I don't feel like I've changed anyone's underlying values. What I have done is showed them how all the values that are already at the top of their priority list, which may or may not be the same as mine, are the very values that make them care about climate change. So sometimes it might be the fact that someone is a member of the Rotary Club 
And the Rotary Club has four questions it asks, is it fair, you know, is it, is it the truth, is it beneficial to all, and those apply directly to climate change. Sometimes it might be because someone is a parent and they care about their child, or they care about birding or hiking or outdoor activities. Sometimes it might be because they have former military experience, or they're a business person who cares about the security of the local economy, or there's someone who cares about justice and poverty. Whatever it is that we have at the top of our list, we can connect climate change to it. And I think that's what David was referring to. But often for us scientists, what's at the top of our list is science. And we connect so innately over a shared love and curiosity for science that we scientists often struggle more than anyone else in terms of figuring out how to connect with others. And in fact, it's, it's interesting. I just wrote a book. It's not quite out yet. It's called Saving Us, A Climate Scientist's Guide to Hope and Healing in a Divided World. It's here because I was just going through and editing all of my references, as you can see. But in the book, I talk about how wherever I go, the biggest question I get asked is, how do I talk to fill in the blank about climate change? And it's scientists who have the biggest problem answering this question. Sometimes I've even had to go through a list with them, like, do you enjoy this or this or this? Are you part of this organization or that or that? And finally, after 15 questions, the scientist says, well, I do dive. I am a diver. And I'm like, yes, why not talk to other people who dive about how climate change is affecting the ocean? Or another scientist at NASA said, well, I like to cook with my friends. And I said, well, there you go. Talk about how climate change is affecting our food. Another woman said, well, I'm, I want to talk to my grandmother. So I said, well, what do you do with her? She said, I knit. So I said, well, get the warming stripes that Ed Hawkins has developed and knit a scarf with your grandma of the place where, you, where she grew up and have her tell you stories and see how it got warmer over time. I buy, so I, I, bu I buy that scarf. Yes, exactly. I'll knit you one. <laughs> So we can do this. It just requires us to think outside our box a little bit. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, Dr. Inwood wants to react to this. Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to add in another component of that, which is that as a scientist and having had to go and talk to many communities about really challenging issues that they're facing is we also need to listen. Sometimes we're so intent on trying to make something okay or trying to convey a particular uh, viewpoint that we don't listen. And I'll never forget that uh, in one forum where, that, that I attended where we were actually dealing with a mining proposal and it was a community that was living really near the community, uh, near the mining proposal. And this gentleman was absolutely just furious with his veins popping in his neck and, you know, you know that tension, oh, I don't want to listen to him because he's too angry. And I won't go into the full story. The bottom line is he had solutions to the environmental concerns that he had. And if we had not taken the time to actually sit back and listen to what he had to say, we would not have actually come up with something that was really innovative. So the, the thing that I really learned about that is about not making assumptions about who you're dealing with and what the issues are and to make sure that you actually listen so that you can engage meaningfully to solve problems. Climate change, pollution and waste, biodiversity and nature loss are the same types of issues that we need to engage in in the same way. Yeah. Um, and I think I wanna segue that again into uh, Mr. Perry's ex uh, expertise. Um, if scientists may be really good at answering the questions they come up with themselves and not so good as we hear right now in listening and we could learn from that, I believe businesses um, survive by listening to their customers. Is there something we can learn um, from the way businesses do this? Well, well, this is what business is waking up to slowly. So, so if I quote Henry Ford, if I'd listened to my customers, I would have given them a faster horse. Customers never know what the answer is. They just tell you what the problem is. And you've got, as a business, got to go off and interpret what the solution is. Steve Jobs is exactly the same. No one asked him for an iPhone. But when he turned up with one, people said, that's what I need. Business, business Every single year. Well, yeah, there, there is overconsumption. But business generally is better than politicians at preparing for these shifts and changes. Politicians live in the very much in the here and now. Politics in the UK today is dominated by the idea of a European super league. It's here and now. It's not the climate crisis. It's not going to fundamentally change our life. 
but it plays to the press and people today. I think business is better, but not perfect, at looking over the horizon and saying, the diesel car is dead, we need to prepare for the electric future. A meat-based diet is under pressure. We need to find alternatives um, coming down the lines. Business generally is a little bit better at triangulating the many uncertain issues that surround it and turning it into, and this is what we should do about it. But again, that, that's, not, that's not saying business is perfect. And I think that relates into a question that uh, Karsten Haustein has put up, and I think it, it's best to address that to you as well, Mr. Berry, which is um, some businesses have a huge impact on how we view the world uh, around us. Uh, you've mentioned Apple, but especially media businesses, the Murdoch and Media Empire, for example, they have a huge potential to form public opinion, etc. Is is that part of the well? I'm kind of answering my own question, but do you also see that as part of the problem? And what should we do about it? If yes, well, very briefly, I think we've seen traditionally people have focused on business and climate change is very much about emissions. So it's the big oil companies, the big coal companies, of course, they need to be pressed. But business is starting to realise that its power of advocacy, its voice, and for the media companies very specifically, what they broadcast is just as powerful. I mean, we've seen the, the Sea Spiracy um, documentary coming out about the plight of the oceans from Netflix. That's probably had more impact on citizens across the world at understanding what's happening to the oceans than hundreds, if not thousands, if not millions of scientific papers. It's a little bit sad. And I know that people have got some concerns about the specific science used in sea spiracy, but it's cut through and it's got people's attention. So I think the big broadcast platforms do have a role. I'm very careful though in terms of free speech. As soon as we ask media outlets to become just another campaigning voice to say, climate change is everything. We need dissent, we need challenge. What we don't need is the lies and the obfuscation that we've had from the fossil industry and the supporters in some of the right wing press traditionally. So I want to um, move this to Mr. Mayor again. Um, you've talked about different values and even Mr. Murdoch has its own set of values. Should we should we listen to those as well when making decisions? Well, um, if I could tell a brief story, I, I live in Texas, which is the center of the oil and gas industry. I'm going to come back to you oh, in a few sorry, seconds, Professor yeah. Ayo, with first David Mayer um, was going to answer. Well, I was quite excited by how to, uh, how to address these things in Texas. I mean, uh, from what I've understood from the values scholarship and literature, which is, which is quite considerable, um, you know, the, these, the values that we hold, these underlying values, firstly, they don't dictate or determine any particular policy course of action. So the future is, is to be written. Uh, the, these things that people care about, these underlying values, as some of the, the great social scientists have understood, they found these regularities across all sorts of societies across the world. So they seem to be a pretty good guide to what people really want what what is the ought uh, they seem pretty stable but they do not determine any particular policy or another but on the other hand uh, they can't be sort of automatically written out of the question they some may not be relevant for any particular policy issue but you do need to do the hard yards to go through and understand them and then understand what the impact of these different values what people want how it's going to play out in the particular issue gather the evidence to, to evidence the concern and the value that's there, uh, and then go back and, and discuss it before you can begin to have a basis to reaching some conclusion on it. And then right at the end of the, the process, what seems to be possibly useful is that you frame the scientific evidence in ways which remains truthful and non-contradictory and accurate, but the framing looks different depending on who you're talking to or which values you're talking to. And we have some further work to work out how to do that in an open, transparent, ethical, non-misleading way. But that, I think, is going to be an important part of the question that we learn how to frame the same science in perhaps different ways. That means it sometimes sounds different, but it is, in fact, the same science. It's the same message, and we're not contradicting ourselves. 
And now I'd also really love to, <laughs> to hear about how that works in Texas. I apologize for jumping the queue there. You are an excellent moderator. Um, so, so here in Texas, as you know, it's you know one of the centers of the oil and gas industry of the world. And I was asked a few years ago to speak to the executive board of an oil and gas company about climate change. And I don't speak to people unless I can figure out some way that we can connect. And I thought to myself, how am I going to connect? What value do we share? And it took me a few weeks. I had to consider it. But finally, it dawned on me. I am profoundly grateful for energy. And that energy has been provided for foss by fossil fuels for the last few hundred years. A woman's life 200 years ago was difficult. It was often short. It was full of tasks and chores that took all day. So education, liberty, long life and long health were things that were not freely available to people before the industrial revolution. So when that dawned on me, I realized I could connect with them over that. And so that was one of the first things I said when I walked in the room and most people were sort of sitting here like this, like <laughs> who invited her and how long does this last? I started off by expressing my gratitude for fossil fuels. And it was as if all the faces cleared and they said, you get it, we need energy. We can't live without energy. And I said, you're right. But just as we don't use horses and buggies and party line telephones, in the same way, we don't need the old ways of getting energy that we've been using for 300 years anymore. So how are we going, how are we, how are we going to ensure that we continue to get the energy we need in the future and you are able to provide jobs for all of the people who you care about. And we were able to have the most amazing discussion after that because of that beginning with those shared values. And it's not always possible. It's not always possible to do that. And not everybody is the right person to have a conversation with everyone else. There are many conversations I've turned down because I couldn't find a place to connect. But when we can, I feel like that's where the change happens. And it begins, like Andrea said, it begins by listening to what people care about first rather than coming in with what we think that they need to hear. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hinwood, from a UN perspective, I like that Professor Ayo addressed that um, women's life have improved greatly over 200 years. So have men's life, but, but we were ahead and we're clo you're closing in, you were not there yet. Um, but I also think there's a huge diversity if you look uh, globally, different regions um, and um, I'd like you to address a little bit, how, if we want to implement policies on a global level even, what are we going to say to people that say, I want to have a refrigerator as well, because we still don't have one. Yeah, and, and uh, you, we must address the underlying inequalities that exist, and we do need to address uh, poverty and social disadvantage and we need to make sure that we do improve the lives of women because COVID in some locations, and while you know, I do think overall it has actually shown us some really positive things, there have been some negative consequences of COVID in some parts of the world where more disadvantaged have actually become more disadvantaged. Now, this is where environmental quality comes in, and this is where you're able to deal with social, economic, and environmental systems to actually improve outcomes. So nature-based solutions, uh, sustainable agriculture, you know, we, we need to provide food for the population, and there are ways of doing it that are going to both improve the environment, improve people's lives, and cut back on, on greenhouse gas emissions. And I think, you know, sometimes perhaps we go, you know, we, it is complex. I'm not saying it's straightforward, but there are solutions that can be applied that are local, that may not be high tech. Sometimes they will be, and we need to actually start now. So what we need to do is to galvanize that action globally. And I actually think we do have an agenda. Um, the UN is very clear that we need to address these planetary crises before 2030. And we are working on the sustainable development goals. So we do integrate society, economy, environment to improve the lives of um, the world's citizens. So I, I guess I, I am positive. I actually believe that we can make these changes, but we do need to actually have those conversations. Uh, so we've been looking at 
the, the positive things that we can learn from what happened with COVID. And let me address that. It is a terrible disaster that happened that we should never had. Um, but given that it has, we've been looking at what we can learn from it. What you say is um, we, we need to implement these things. Now, if I look at the local uh, governmental level, what I see here in the Netherlands happening is that uh, we're slowly coming out of this crisis. And with policy right now, what we're hearing is we should put on hold these policies on uh, additional nitrous uh, pollution because we need to re we kick start our economy again and get that going. Um, that feels like a threat to achieving our climate goals. Um, is that something that we should, and I'm thinking, I'm looking at Dr. Hinwood and uh, Mr. Mayor here, is that something we should address on a local level, on a, on a European or global level, uh, Dr. Hinwood? I, I think we need to address it at, at a global level, and we are actually talking about the building back better and to change the, the economic systems that we've currently got in place and the way that we change investment and finance. Um, because those things will change industry and business. And we can do that at, you know, for those international operators. But I also think we need to look at it at the local and national scale. And, and I guess the philosophy we have is that we are, if we are able to influence and advocate at the global level, we want that to filter down for the regions and at the local level to make a difference. So I, I think what we are advocating is that this should be on an emergency footing, but we don't we don't want to um, we, we don't want to spook the horses as it were. We actually want to make sure that we do this with long term economic stability, with society firmly in view, with as I as I said before, addressing the inequalities, but getting those environmental changes. So, um, Mr. Mayor, you're working at a European level. Um, within the EU, there's a lot of uh, policy freedom at the national level as well. How do you deal with that um, well, tension field, I would say, in Dutch between those between those levels in implementing um, in implementing policy? Well, I mean, uh, people have made lengthy academic careers uh, explaining the multi-level governance of the European Union. So I, I'd, I'd hesitate to, I'd hesitate to try and summarise that, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, you know the European Union itself is a unique political construct and has a very complex relationship with decision-making levels at national level and regional and local and all the rest of it. Um, what I would say, some a very much much smaller thing that that we are simply trying to do in, in the JRC is uh, to try and connect up the scientists working to influence policy within the European Union. So we're we're trying not just to work in our little bubble inside the European Union, but actually we're trying to uh, to to make sure that there are scientists. Uh, who are able to bring knowledge into the policy process at all levels of government. And each, of course, each country in Europe is different, have different systems of government. Some of the regions are more important than others. So we're doing our best to make sure that every government has, has the science it can, it can draw upon and that these scientists are all connected, which is very important in particular for smaller countries that may not be able to invent a whole sort of science policy system of their own, but will need to draw on science from wherever it comes uh, across the world. Because it's undoubtedly important that, um, uh, that we have countries and the nation state is an important construct that is important in decision making. It's also incredibly important in our identity and therefore um, uh, national identity and national decision making is is a very important part of this complex equation about what will be decided. And so, long story short, I think it's going to be important that if you want to influence policy in country X, you have a scientist from also country X who speaks the local language X and brings the best advice about what the science is saying in a way in that local national language and which is contextualized for the local national conditions. That I think is incredibly 
important. Some sort of uh, anonymous global scientist saying everything's got to change, talking in a foreign language in a way that appears to be ignorant of the local political, environmental, social and economic context. That's probably not going to pass those messages. So uh, that, you know, uh, as always in, in, in persuasion and communication, that the identity, ethos, uh, values of the messenger is just as important as the, the content uh, of the message. And as I'm saying this, of course, in science, it doesn't matter, or at least it appears not to matter. Science, the independent republic of science, knows no national or language boundaries uh, and works very, very well. But I think one of the reflections that's come out of our work is that science is a, is a very unique community. It is a community which prizes truth telling and fact and accuracy and uh, that is a core value of being a scientist and so therefore there is never any tension between your identity as a scientist and seeking accuracy truth and these sorts of things and that makes science quite a unique and rare community in most communities sometimes you need to sacrifice the truth and accuracy to maintain the group cohesion uh, and identity and there are solid good reasons why you do that because being part of a community has enormous personal payoffs and that tension is almost never there in science because you know people rarely get kicked out of science for trying too hard to tell the truth or understand reality so there's very little tension and that i think is something that scientists need to recognize that all the social norms and pressures within science go in the same direction of finding the truth and that is not true of all communities i like to and i know that i'm leading this panel and not a panelist but i like to draw a conclusion from that is that if we want to influence policy globally or at least within the eu in all countries it it kind of follows from your statement that we should have scientists from all these communities and if science is dominated by for example white men from the netherlands it's going to be very hard to convince people in lithuania to uh, to implement uh, things and i think that we can extend this to a global uh, i think our work is cut out for us to make science more inclusive in that uh, uh, access as well i want to grab the idea of identity here and, and move on with that. Because um, if I look at myself, I clearly identify as an Apple fanboy looking at this desk. Um, and I think that you mentioned the nation state as a important construct. I think that on may maybe even the same level or bigger than the nation state, uh, internationally operating companies are also part of our identity, part of our culture. We don't have, as far as I know, a mechanism in place to talk to these companies and address new science in the same way that we have to talk to policy leaders on a nation state or, or EU or global level. So, Mr. Perry, should we have that? Should we have the same attitude towards talking to companies and informing them about the current science as we do to policymakers? Yes, I, and I think business has got, as we've heard today, enormous power to cause harm and hopefully good. And a lot of business today is not well informed by science. They understand their specific specialism of making an ever better um, phone, but not the sort of the true implications of that phone, its impact on the environment, the wider scientific ecosystem. So I think making business leaders more scientifically literate without asking them to be scientists I think is very, very important. And I think the best businesses that I see out there have a very good way of taking basic science and turning into day-to-day -day reality. They have that, but too many don't. Um, and it's, it's not a question of just sending hundreds of scientific papers to a boardroom and saying, please read these now. We all between us need to form a bridge between those two worlds to say, this is what the science means. And I'm, you know, I'm a keen follower of Catherine on social media, and I think does a brilliant job at making science not just accessible to citizens, but science accessible to leaders of, of, of every part of civil society, politics and business. And we need more of that. So um, I want to move the mic then to Professor Hale again. 
Um, you've been successful in talking to companies. You've just addressed uh, oil companies in Texas. And, and my accent changes when I mention them. So um, I don't think that, but that's my personal opinion, every scientist should be a trained science communicator. I think it's a team sport um, and we need people of, of all, covering all bases on that field. But for those people that do want to take up that role, I'm especially addressing early career scientists that feel like they want to engage with either businesses to inform them on the current state of science or with policymakers. You've been there. What would be your key advice to, to geo, early career geoscientists listening right now? Well, first of all, I want to emphasize the point that you just led with, which is that there is a whole spectrum over which scientists can contribute. And there's no run, one right place for any one person to be on that spectrum. We need people doing the sound science, publishing it in the peer reviewed journals. We need people writing essays in the conversation to explain it to a broader academic audience. We need people um, speaking at their children's school like I did yesterday. We need people engaging with the local community, with local industry and businesses, with local elected officials. We need everybody all the way to NASA scientist, Jim Hansen, who you know, would chain himself to fences and protests. We need people across the whole spectrum. And where you fall is an individual decision that you yourself make. And there is no right or wrong. It's just a matter of where you feel that you can contribute the best. And that may change over time. In general, younger scientists tend to be more interested in engaging, I feel like. And um, when we do, it's important to recognize what are we uniquely good at? So some people are just amazing at making videos. Climate Adam, for example. Some people are really good at social media. Some people are fantastic about writing books like my colleague, Kim Nicholas in Sweden who just wrote a great public um, interest book on climate change. Some people are very good at engaging with and building relationships with key decision makers behind the scenes um, like Ken Caldera with Bill Gates, for example. So we each have something you need to contribute and focus on what it is that you are interested in, that you value, find like-minded people. Um, like for example, Gabe Becky, who's a hurricane scientist, he plays ice, ice hockey. And he figured out that many of the people he plays ice hockey with were not so sure about climate change or why it mattered. So he decided to look into how climate change was affecting outdoor ice hockey in North America and share that with them. So we each have something unique, who we are and what we can do. And if we focus on that, we can be most effective with the limited time that we have because outreach can take up as much time as you allow it. So deciding how much time we have ahead of time, what's the most effective way to use our time and then constantly going back, reevaluating, monitoring what we did, what was the best investment of our time is really important. I, I fully agree with you. Um, I think that you and me are currently of the uh, people here, the, or the, of the panelists here, uh, those active in academia um, and uh, you're a senior scientist, I'm coming out of early career, so call it mid-level. I think that there's an onus on us, not on the early career scientists to also recognize when people do that and, and implement policies that um, make sure that it's not only your age index that makes sure that you get promoted to the next level because otherwise we're gonna lose these people. Um, and I think I wanna uh, move to Dr. Hindu uh, for that. If you, you've been in science and you've moved to, well, the UN Environment Program, um, Science, academia is a pyramid. There's only so many uh, assistant professor places available for uh, a lot of PhDs. Um, from your perspective, if someone wants to have impact within, let's say, your realm, uh, coming from a PhD and moving into policy, what would be the best advice you can give them at the current early career stage of their, uh, of their career? Uh, at, at the early stage of their career is to make sure that they can communicate their science to those who are going to use it. I think what I discovered, because I have been an academic, and one of the benefits I have having been an academic, but also then working for government, I actually know how to use the science that academics produce. So, lots of academics don't know how they're 
how their work is going to be used by regulators or by policymakers. And I think one of the benefits when you transition is I actually know how to use that in a government setting. So I guess if I look at my younger self or younger academics, I'd be saying, as you do your research, always partner with someone who's going to use your work because they give you that perspective too, you have to be able to communicate it. Um, if you're gonna work in the science policy interface, you've got to deal with people from a range of different disciplines and you've got to be able to communicate your science in an easily understandable way. And that means written and verbal. And you know what I like about young scientists is that they are so much more clever in how they use, oh, no, seriously, in their visual skills and their, you know, those very clever short videos that I see that, you know, I do. And, you know, when, when academics now do abstracts, the graphical abstracts, that they're able to actually put their papers into simple abstracts, just a fantastic. And guess what? That resonates and that's really, really useful. Uh, in your career going forward. So I would partner, I would, I would work with a range of sectors. I'd make sure that when you craft your research, if you're really interested in the impact side of it, to actually think about that up front. And as I say, make sure you get those science communication skills honed when you move into, the, into, a, into a different career. Um, it's pretty exciting, by the way, anyone out there who's interested in, in moving from academia into to government or into an organisation like UNEP, uh, it's just fantastic. So, well, I, I think that um, that's wonderful advice. And I think that uh, this two weeks of EGU, there's a lot of activities organised for early career scientists, but I think also that a lot of later career stage scientists could benefit from these uh, addressing how to do science communication uh, and how to interface with with policy. So I would advise, we're at the start of these two weeks of EGU, I would advise anyone to um, to look in the schedule and see if you can find anything, if you'd like that, to do so. You'll probably find me in, uh, in most of these sessions because I enjoy them every year. Um, Mr. Barry, you're um not trained as a scientist i did see that you did chemistry in your uh in your education but then quickly moved into uh, uh retail but you have communicated with a lot of scientists if there was like one thing that you say oh i wish they'd understood this about my world what part i of think your it, world? i think it's the potential of business to help turn science into solutions so I, I think many scientists just don't register there is this thing called business out there. If they do register it, they've, you know, and rightly so, they, they see business as a big part of the problem. See, you know, the majority of emissions on the planet. Only at a very tertiary level do people then say, but what can I do to develop science to solve this? Now, when we bring science into solving the issues like battery storage, you know, we can see the science, the chemistry that's pouring now into bringing us solutions. And I want more people to see that Business is the problem, but business can also bring to the marketplace and scale up the solutions that you're inventing in the lab or you're writing about, and it can be your partner for good. And there's a good way and a bad way of communicating with business. And if you understand the way of working with business, you know, that's a great opportunity for you. Well, thank you. And we're getting close to the final few minutes of this, uh, of this panel session. I've been enjoying it greatly so far uh, i want to give all of the panelists a final one minute to make a final statement maybe a call to action to uh, all our viewers online and everybody that will be watching this uh, recorded live stream uh, later on and i think we'll be doing that in the order that we had the uh, presenter so uh, professor hey if you had one minute to address our audience finally what would you be saying mm -hmm. i would say that Climate change is the great threat multiplier. We don't care about it in and of itself. If the only thing that was happening was the average temperature of the planet were increasing by one, two, three, or even four degrees, but nothing else was happening, it would not be at the forefront of all our minds or concerns today. The reason we care about it is because it takes everything else in this world that we are already worried about. It takes every single sustainable development goal and makes it more difficult to achieve. 
if I could do something, I would actually take number 13, climate action, out of the sustainable development goals and sort of put it in like an over an arch over them. Because the reason we care about climate change is because we care about hunger, poverty, lack of access to basic education, healthcare, gender equity, jobs for people, clean energy for people, clean water. This is why we care. And again, that means that to care about climate change, we only have to be one thing, a human, and that we all are that. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Heyu. Dr. Inwood, some final words. We have um, under 10 years uh, to 2030 to actually uh, address the sustainable development goals and actually meet our goals across the range of different areas. And I guess I would encourage people to posit positively embrace the integration of environmental issues with the social and the economic, but importantly, to engage in what the information is telling us and working out how we can get involved. And I think that we are innovative, we are clever, look at, look at the society that we have. We are quite incredible and that's everybody. So uh, I think uh, science, information, uh, education and paying attention to environmental issues and working out where you can make a difference would be terrific. Well, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Berry, if you had a few, one more minute to address our audience. Very briefly, be clear, we're living in a climate crisis. Um, you've got an opportunity now, once in a generation opportunity, to move from incremental improvements that have dominated the economy, society, policy for the last 40 years. We've got an opportunity in the next five or 10 years to radically reimagine society, society and the economy that supports it. And those radical changes have to be informed by science. They have to be informed by science. And we'll only reach that potential if the scientific community can find a way of connecting with business, explaining the need for change, the possibility of change, and actually how if we change things can be fundamentally better for all of us. I'm very excited about the way that scientists can do that. Well, thank you very much. Um, and finally, Mr. Mayor, your final minutes to address our audience. Oh, that's quite daunting, isn't it? Um, I can only echo what others have said, but uh, I think it is without question that we are going to need science in, in massive quantities and the very highest quality to be able to tackle these problems. Um, so uh, the value and importance of science is without question. But uh, I think what I would encourage scientists to do is to understand and read a little bit of the science of science and policy. So read a bit of philosophy of science, read a bit of the psychology of how persuasion works, read up on behavioral biases, understand these things, because unfortunately, all the normal mechanisms, processes, behaviors and habits by which you win scientific arguments don't really work if you want to persuade policymakers, politicians, and citizens to do something different. Science has a very particular form of processes by which it reaches the truth and or the best version of the truth that we currently have. Uh, and the processes by which we decide what we as societies, communities, and uh, uh, governments and whatever are going to do involve different ways of thinking and talking about the evidence and you need to do them rather than simply you know don't treat policymakers, citizens and politicians as if they were fellow scientists thank you very much um to all speakers here i want to thank you very much um, for your contribution to this session. If I learned anything today, it would be that if you want to communicate outside of the scientific community about your science, have impact on policy, on business, on communities at any level, it would be to be interested in these processes and in these people. So be interested in policy, learn how it works, businesses learn how it works, and people and learn how they work and what matters to them. Um, I think I have heard that echo uh, throughout this panel session. Um, it's been valuable to me 
in preparing this, I've read up on your work and I can encourage anyone in the audience to seek out the work by these panelists because uh, it has informed me a lot and I hope it will inform you a lot as well. I want to stop before everybody leaves the session by mentioning a few people that were uh, really valuable in getting this session off the ground. First of all, my co-conveners, Professor Ian Stewart, Professor Haley Fowler, Mr. Nick Everard, and Professor Hannah Cloak. Um, I think that they took leadership. They invited me to be part of this, and I'm really grateful for that uh, opportunity. Um, and finally, before I press leave meeting for all, I want to thank uh, Chloe Hill, who has been on the uh, on the support of uh, uh, of EGU and Martin Rasmussen, who has been doing the technology for this session. It would have not worked without them. They've been behind the scene, providing me with the questions, making sure our connection is stable. Um, science is a team effort, and they're definitely part of this team. So thank you all. Uh, thank you all for this amazing session, and I hope you're having a really good two more weeks of EGU.